Welcome to our August garden. At this time of year, even our slow growing crops are finally reaching maturity, so there is a lot to do. We need to start curing large harvests of onions and garlic so they store it all winter long for us. But while we're taking care of jobs like that, there is still regular harvesting and processing required for many other crops. In this video, I'll share a few lessons from our activities this past month. I'll explain how we know exactly when to harvest our corn. I'll show you the process we use to renovate our strawberry beds to maintain their productivity. And I've even got results to share from our experiment with growing potatoes in containers. That's all coming up. At our home plot this month, we're gonna start things off at the area where I've been most curious. That is with our container potato growing trial. Their containers are empty right now because we harvested them just a couple of days ago and we'll share that process with you now. Um, just to remind you of the, the setup here before we get into the details, we had two rows of container grown potatoes. The row on my left here is all plastic containers, 10 gallons in size. The row on my right is all fabric containers, 10 gallons in size. They each had the individual drip lines serving each bed individual drip lines to each container. So that water was totally consistent. The growing medium was totally consistent. It consisted of 50% compost, 50% sunshine number four mix, which is mostly, well, it's entirely peat moss and perlite. And we added our same ratio of soil block mix fertilizer that we use for starting seeds as well into this larger volumes. And in each of these containers, we planted two seed potatoes about a third of the way from the bottom before filling the rest of the container with additional potting mix. And this seed density matched the seed density of our typical beds out in the field where we've got about 20 seed potatoes usually over a space of 50 square feet. So there's the setup. The plants had everything they needed, we think. Now did they perform? Let's have a look at the results. So we started just by removing the old dead vines You'll notice these are completely died back. We wanted to wait till the plants were totally matured to make sure we didn't leave any potential yield on the table here. The next step was removing the drip line components. They're a little bit fragile and we'll be walking around here. So I just wanted to get those out of the way. Now the process that we chose for harvesting was to dump the entire containers into a, a larger container, then sort through with the kids and, and find the potatoes and put them back on top of the containers from which they came. So this is a bit more labor intensive than what it needed to be, but it helped us stay really organized to make sure we knew how many potatoes came from each container. Next, we went through each container and counted all of the potatoes that were yielded from that container and measured the total mass. Once that data was recorded, I loaded up the potatoes and hauled them off into the shed to cure for a few days. And since then they've been bagged up and are now in our walk-in cooler for the winter. So of course I graphed the data because that's what I like to do. We've got the data organized in the same orientation as it was in the field. We've got fabric containers on the left here and plastic containers on the right. Our yield is the vertical axis here. So the higher the bar, the greater the yield. And in each case, we've got the total yield from 10 seed potatoes in a 25 square foot area. So together, all of these potatoes here, Bellanita and Norland, in the fabric containers make up one standard bed worth of container grown potatoes. Likewise for the plastic containers. What you'll probably notice right away is that the bars are higher on the plastic container side, both for the Bellanita potatoes and the Norland potatoes. This worked out to an average of about 20% increase in yield on the plastic container side. And since it was consistent across both varieties, I'd say it was more than just chance or preference of a certain variety that made the plastic containers better. I would attribute the advantage of the plastic containers to their ability to hold moisture a little better than the fabric containers. We know that potatoes need moist but well draining soil to really size up nicely. So based on this data alone, uh, if you're going to grow potatoes in containers, choose plastic containers. But how does container production compare to field production, you're probably wondering. Now let's look at some data from last year's trial to get a little bit of insight into that question. So last year we did a trial comparing a double dig bed with a no-till bed with a no-dig bed. And here's that data to compare. And this data was from the same number of seed potatoes over the same square footage of growing area. So it's a reasonably fair comparison. And we also had a Norland 
potato variety in this trial too, which is handy. So our first bed was a double dig bed in that trial. And you can see there that Norlin potatoes worked out in the similar range as compared to these container grown potatoes. The smart potato variety that was in that trial still exceeded um, by a significant amount there in yield. When we move to our no dig bed, our Norland potato is still kind of in the same range, although smart potato dropped significantly in that no dig method. And then lastly, in our no till growing method, this is our standard method of bed preparation, just broad forking the bed, topping with compost, the usual, and then burying the seed potato four to six inches below the surface and, and then hilling the potatoes once in the middle of the season to make sure there are no exposed tubers. So with that standard practice there, our northern potatoes still kind of come out on par with the container grown potatoes on average and smart was this and the smart potatoes were still higher but we don't really have a reference point for smart potatoes because they weren't in the container trials. So I think this data is enough to justify containers as a viable growing method for potatoes. It certainly offers us comparable yields as to what we could get in the field. And I love the advantage of being able to start our potatoes a month earlier than usual because we could get them going in containers in the high tunnel and then transfer them out into the field when the temperatures were warmer. That's a nice advantage. This could be a great way to optimize the use of our high tunnel space more regularly going forward. The downside of the containers was that there was a significant cost to buying these containers and also the potting soil to fill them up. So are these additional costs worth it for the advantage of the flexibility of an early start and the ability to move your potatoes halfway through the season? That's for you to decide. So that's how this trial turned out. I'm excited to be able to have these numbers now and share this with you. Will we do any trial like this in the future again? Probably, I'll be curious to try something else or other variations of this down the road. But for now, we're gonna leave it there and move on to the far end of our high tunnel, which we've been kind of skipping out on so far this season. <clears throat> now, for one of my long-awaited trials that started way back in winter, it is ginger, a brand new crop that we've never tried before. I'm gonna dig a little bit of this up today because the next time I see you in late September, this might be frozen already. For sure, it's not gonna be happy with those temperatures. So come on in close, let's see what's actually happening under here. I'll remind you that we started these ginger plants from their rhizomes, just their, their roots, like the typical ginger chunks that you buy in a grocery store. That, those are the rhizomes of the ginger plant. Broke those into sections, planted them in a 10 by 20 flat, covered with a potting mix, watered it, put it on a heat mat, and let them start sprouting. And ever since late winter for us, we've been tending these, and now they're just starting to look comfortable in all of this heat we've been getting. So they're, yeah, they're not supposed to be growing in Saskatchewan. But we're giving it a shot this year because, well, we eat ginger, so let's see if we can do it. So, if we dig down a little lower here, let's see what we can find. Have these rhizomes increased in size at all? Have they spread out? I have not done this by myself yet. I'm just totally curious to dig down here and experience this with you. <laughs> Why are you giggling about that? I'm serious. Oh, okay, I just broke off a little nub. Oh, it smells. Do you smell that yet? Yeah. I don't even want tea, but it makes me want tea. If that doesn't make sense, but look at the color on that. It's beautiful. Maybe we should okay. dig one out. We'll just dig one out. Then we'll at least see what happened here. Okay, so the old growth was right here. Mm -hmm. That's the old rhizome. Okay, and all this all the white the light colored and pink stuff on the back is all new. It does smell pretty awesome. So this is an organic ginger variety. I don't know the variety name. It just was available in our corner store. The ginger that was smaller than grocery store ginger to begin with. So I'm actually kind of satisfied with the amount of growth that's here compared to the original piece. It's say four times as much in, in volume or mass as the original piece. Oh, it smells so good. Okay, uh, it's probably gonna die if I put it back. So we should probably take this inside and enjoy it, right Rachel? Yeah. Okay, 
stir fry night. Thank you, Ginger. Yeah, we should move on, but that that could have been a lot more disappointing than it was, to be honest. So, looks looks decent. Okay, on the south side here, we've got a bed of strawberries that's newly getting established. So my job this year in this bed was to first transplant these strawberries in early spring, but very sparsely because I want to take advantage of the ability of these plants to multiply with their runners. These, the plants that start from runners this year will be the most productive next year. So in my perfect world, I would have a, a bed that's 100% filled with these new runner plants. That's really pokey. Okay, so the way I can do that is to plant about 20% of these holes with transplants in spring. And then throughout summer, as these runners develop, and you'll find that the spacing is, is quite convenient too. Like they're naturally about a foot apart here. That gives you just the right amount of space to plug one of these new daughter plants into a adjacent hole. So we'll take a staple to make sure that it stays here and starts to send these roots down in an actual growing site. We'll staple it down. I hope I have another staple. Take that next one. Same thing in the next hole. So th now those will just root naturally for us during the rest of the summer. And next year we'll get mature plants here and fruit throughout this whole bit. So that's, that's been the project here. There hasn't been much to show, but that's what we're doing. Each of these plants have a significant number of runners sent out right now, so we can divvy them up through all the available holes, and make sure we have get a nice even coverage throughout this bit. We've been loving the corn harvest over the last week and a bit, and I've held on to a couple of cobs here for you to be able to show you what it takes to diagnose the perfect timing to harvest your corn. When you see the silks of your corn start to dry and brown like this, you know you're in the sweet spot for harvest timing. And at that time, I'll often come back through the patch here and peel back a couple of these cobs and see what's going on in, underneath. First of all, we look for full kernels and a bit of color at the end of the cob here. If it's still all white and smaller than this and less juicy looking than this, they've probably got some time to go. These are looking pretty good right now and I actually know that they're ripe and a little bit maybe on the mature side of ripe. You can also do a thumbnail test by poking these kernels with your thumb. If it's just about right, you should see some juicy substance. <laughs> I don't know if you saw that squirt come out of there. There we go again. If they're not quite ripe, that substance will be very clear. But if they're ripe, it'll be milky like you see there. And if they're beyond ripe, they'll lose that juiciness and start to solidify into just a, a drier starchiness. So this cob is great. I'm gonna snap it off now. Jane, can you grab those other cobs too? Oh yeah. Yeah, you can grab this one here, Arla. Yeah. Now, if you ever open up your ear of corn and just become disappointed because you notice that you've got gaps in your kernels, like there are gaps throughout your cob that look like this without full kernels, that's a pollination failure. Every single one of these kernels here is the ovary of the female flower and it's tied to a single strand in the corn silk. And that silk forms the tip of your female flower of the plant. The male flower is on the top of the plant. In order for successful pollination of every single one of these kernels of corn, pollen has to travel from one of these male flowers up here down to every single one of these strands of silk below which is an amazing feat. So if you've had difficulty in the past getting your ears of corn to fill out nicely with kernels throughout the cob from bottom to top, the problem is pollination. And the cause was probably that you just had a skinny row or a really short cluster, in which case you're really decreasing the odds of the pollen being able to travel from the male flower down to every single strand of silk below. So to improve your pollination in the future, widen your row and lengthen that row to increase the size of your corn patch and your pollination will dramatically improve as a result. Okay, we're gonna slip under the strawberry patch. Are you coming Mama, with us, girls? I was gonna say it's almost time to dig that down. Yeah. yeah, we could probably take this down. The strawberry bed has gone through a pretty dramatic change since our last chat in July. We finished the last harvest in late July, early August, and a week after that, I immediately 
cut down the entire patch. This is part of the annual renovation process that we give our June bearing strawberries and it has several purposes. The purpose of cutting all of the plants at, at their base and eliminating all the leaves that are currently on the plant is to stimulate new growth in the plant and eliminate the number of dead leaves around the plant that we have to clean up later. The more deadfall that we have around our strawberry plants, the greater incidence we'll have of problems like gray mold that thrive when there's a lot of um, decaying plant matter around our strawberry beds. So by taking out those leaves, we have minimized the amount of organic matter that'll be lying around the plants later on. Now why wouldn't we leave those leaves and help them continue to produce more plant? Because leaves help plants grow, right? Well, strawberries are unique in that their, their leaves only thrive for four months. After that, they'll die. So the leaves that formed in early spring that were now thriving on the plant will die before fall and just cover the ground here with lots of that decaying plant matter that we don't want. So if we just cut them off right away, we can encourage the plant to develop new growth right away and the leaves that form right now are going to be around next spring still to help that early growth in spring take off. So that covers why we cut the leaves off right away. Next, we want to take some time to thin our patch. This is the perfect opportunity because right after you've cut the leaves, you can see everything really well. You can reassess the plant density and make sure you've got the right number of plants in a bed. We want about 50 plants in our beds that are actively producing berries every year. That's about one plant per square foot. That's a great spacing for June bearing strawberries. We've got 60 holes in each of our landscape fabric templates here. So we've got a little bit of leeway for establishing new plants every year as well. So the matter of density is one reason why we really love using this landscape fabric for strawberries. Because their runners can so easily root anywhere in the bed, the fact that we've got the landscape fabric really helps us control that plant spacing. When I have these set growing spaces for each of our strawberries, I don't have strawberry plants springing up everywhere in the bed. They only are allowed to grow where I put them. And now is the perfect time to reassess that and fill any remaining holes. So for example, we've got a hole right here where we had maybe a transplant failure last spring. But anyways, it's empty right now. So we'll look for a runner from nearby. Here is one. And we'll just take a second to pin that down in the space there. We'll leave it attached to its parent plant. We don't bury it in the in the soil, we just set it down on the surface with that landscape fabric pin so that its roots can start to emerge into the soil. If you don't have the landscape fabric giving you a set spacing like this, then you'll also have to kind of reassess how many plants you've got in every square foot of your bed and physically dig out the ones that have kind of established themselves voluntarily so that you get back to a something in the range of one plant per square foot. Now this is only a second year bed. So we don't see many overgrown plants, but another job that we'll do during the renovation process is look for plants that are really starting to max out their space in their holes. This one's getting close, so next year it might be a candidate for removal, in which case we dig out the entire plant because it's just filling its hole too much. Its crown is just overgrown and it's not going to get give us lots of fresh new growth again next season and we'll refill that hole with a new runner just like we did on this side. Another thing you can consider doing is to top up your beds with a fresh coat of compost. We've been letting our strawberry beds run for four years without any top ups at all and they've still maintained good production into their fourth year. We haven't gone any further than those four years. The last step of your strawberry renovation process could be to enrich your soil in some way. If I could snap my fingers and remove this landscape fabric, top the bed with compost and put it back on, I would. But that's one of the downsides to this landscape fabric. I can't just slip it off and back on easily because the plants just don't slide through all the holes that easily. So it's by, by using this landscape fabric, I've committed to not really interfering with the soil quality or characteristics at all for about four years, the life cycle of this strawberry bed. So I'm going to keep, keep rotating the plants, finding new holes for them, and stimulating new growth during those four years. And if I feel the need, I might pull off the side and slide some compost underneath, but it's a bit annoying to have to do that. So I don't think I'll top the beds up this year. I'll let them roll and see if our performance suffers at all next year without doing any modifications to the soil.
As August comes to a close, we know that we must say goodbye to the warm temperatures and long days that have made vegetable growing relatively easy. It's time to start paying attention to the low temperatures in the weather forecast and managing our frost sensitive crops accordingly. But I'm also really looking forward to other projects like finishing the harvest of our large grain trials this summer and baking our first ever homegrown loaf of bread. I hope that these lessons have introduced you to a few new ideas and methods that you can start to apply in your home garden. These are just a few clips from the full plot tours that I share with our course members every month of the growing season. If you're serious about growing your own food at home, leave a comment below and let me know what subjects you'd like to see included in future plot tour selections like this. See you in the next one.